Hello, this is Professor Nugent, and we're about to start Chapter 4, Perception, Attribution, and Learning. So these are all impro important concepts in organizational behavior, because companies need to understand uh, their employees' perceptions and how to improve perceptions of their employees uh, to each other, from the, corpor the corporation managers to employees and vice versa. The better they understand these topics, the more they can uh, better integrate employees into their organization, uh, help them learn and help them understand um, each other and the organization's goals. Now, here we have to look at and understand perception. Um, wh what are some common problems with perception that people can, can develop and how can we overcome that? And the links between perception um, social learning and attribution um, and also what's involved in learning when, in regards to reinforcement so these are things that we're going to talk about in this chapter okay so perception it's basically a process people use to organize and understand the, um, the data and inputs that they're receiving in day-to-day -day life um, so perception is a way of, um, it's a word where we're trying to organize and understand how people see things um, in their day-to-day -day lives. And different people have different perceptions. So the same event can occur, such as two people having an argument, and then later on when people talk about the argument, the perception of who started the argument, what was it about, the intensity, the, the threatening level, all these different things can, can vary among different people because they all have different perceptions of the event. Okay, so this is important to understand that not everybody sees things the way you say things. Not everybody interprets situations the same way you do. Understanding that will help uh, will help you to understand other people. Now, here's a here's a, a slide, which is the looking at a performance appraisal between the managers between managers and subordinates. And on on one side we have the subordinates' perception, and then we have the manager's perception. And you could see when you talk about past performance, career development, performance development, need for a supervisor's help, and future performance goals and salary, there is a different differencing, a difference in perception between how often these things are mentioned uh, from the subordinates point of view compared to the manager's point of view. So that you could see that when a manager, you know, and you've all been in a situation before where you're in a performance appraisal and you just really, the perception between uh, what is said <clears throat> between the two you feel like there's a, there's a gulf or, or a chasm between you and your manager, and they think, you know, if they're giving you a perfectly fine performance appraisal that's appropriate and uh, relative to your work past year's work experience, and you're feeling that, you know, they're really lacking in what they need to talk about, you know. So that could be why, you know, your perception of what's happening is going to be different from your manager's. Either way, it's just an interesting little study how. They can be usually what corporations and org organizations worry about is the perception difference between their um, upper level employees and lower level employees. Okay, so when you look at this picture, what do you see? And think about it for a second. Now, of course, you're probably ahead of me and, and, and you're thinking that there's two different things to perceive here, and there is. Some people perceive a white goblet. Some people perceive two faces talking to each other. So which of the two did you perceive first? You know, things can sometimes by different people see different things in situations and others. And then you always have to be aware of that. It's sort of just a little example. All right, so if we wanted to put a uh, flow chart to uh, stages of perception, um, this would be sort of uh, a basic outline of, you know, influence factors, the stages of perception, Attention and selection, we're going to go over these in more detail in the further slides. Organization, interpretation, retrieval, 
scripts or schemas and then response, your feelings, your thinking, you're acting upon this information. So this is a basic template, but we're going to break this down in a more individual slides as we move through it. So let's look at attention and selection. Okay, so in attention and selection, you have selective screening um, that only lets us, a small portion of the information in. So uh, when you're doing a selective screening, um, well, some of the selective screening that we do comes from control processing, consciously deciding what information to pay attention to uh, and what to ignore. You know, for example, if you're uh, if you're with your family in a noisy location, you may just be focusing in what your family says and you're blocking out all this traffic noise, the street noise, other people talking. Um, and a lot of this can take place without any, any conscious awareness. You're just, you know, familiar with, with the situation and you know what you want to focus on. A lot of times, you know, if we're doing, uh, driving a car, we have this automatic process. Um, ever dr take the car out for a ride? And you wind up, before you know it, you, you think that you've, you're driving to work, even though you meant to drive the other way. You know, or when you're driving, you're, you're aware of things like traffic lights and cars, but you don't pay a conscious um, attention to them. So sort of like an automatic processing. Okay. So that's basically two types of selective screening. There's a controlled processing where you're deciding on what it is you want to focus on and there's an um, screening, an automatic screening without conscious awareness that just you basically are focusing on what you want to focus on. You know, for example, if you're in a movie theater um, and, the, and you're focusing on the movie so much, you kind of lose sight, uh, or even if you're in a living room, you may lose sight of the fact that you're sitting on the couch, the people next to you, uh, you're in a room, you may just be completely focused on the movie and not really be conscious of anything help happening around you. That's how I basically know a movie is good. If I'm sitting in a the movie theater and I'm looking at the people uh, next to me, how big the theater is, the walls, the ceiling, um, I'm not really focusing on the movie. But when a movie is something I'm interested in, I'm focusing on, I get sucked into the movie and I really don't, you know, by the time the movie's over, if you ask me, uh, anything that happened in the theater, I won't, I won't remember. I only really focused on the movie itself. Okay. So, okay. So let's talk about schemas. Um, so even though selective screening takes place in the attention stage, it's, you know, it's still necessary for us to organize information efficiently. And this is done to some extent through schemas. And these are cognitive frameworks representing organized knowledge developed through experience about a concept or stimulus. And we commonly use scripts, script schemas, person schemas, and person and situation schemas uh, when, we, when we talk about this. Um, so what is a script schema? It's, uh, it's understanding or a, a pre-knowing of a framework. Uh, and it's a certain, it's a, an appropriate sequence of events that, that would happen in a given moment. You know, for example, experience manager would use a script schema to think about the appropriate steps involved in running a meeting. A meeting. So a, a self a self schema contains information about a person's own appearance, behavior, personality. You know, people who um, decisiveness schemers tend to perceive themselves in terms of that aspect, especially you know, especially in circumstances calling for leadership. All right. Now we also have a person schema, which refers to the way individuals sort through, um, sort others, put others into boxes. Uh, or into groups in terms of their perceived features. Um, so, you know, sort of you go to, maybe you go to a school and you're in a school and you say, okay, I'm gonna put these people in the teacher's box, these people in the fifth grader's box, these people in the fourth grader's box. I mean, you're just kind of organizing people uh, based on certain characteristics. Or, or some kind of commonality associated with members of a particular group. All right. 
So person in a situation schema um, combines the schemas built around a, a person and events. So you kind of combine the two together. And this is really just, you know, um, our recorded perception of a reality is these schemas where we have uh, sort of a script as if it was a script for a movie that we is a framework for us to understand and perceive the situation we're in a lot much much faster and it's based on our experiences all right so let's let's take a step back and think about perception um, now say for example in this in this slide you you've been told that um, your job is going to be downsized uh, now and you're not from you're not familiar with this you've never been laid off now what do you do First step, you take clues from your environment. What's happening around you? Um, you know, so are the security, the security guards approaching you to, to take you out of the building? It, does uh, other people look concerned or upset? Or have other people recently been told? Uh, do you want to pay attention to the salient clues? What's really standing out in this environment? to kind of figure out what's happening. Then you create a mental category for yourself and the self-acceptance of, okay, I'm being laid off. And then you're going to consider, well, how are other people going to respond? <clears throat> Your coworkers, family, uh, things of that nature. So it's all about you have this, something is happening to you, and it takes a while to register what is happening, perceive it for what it is, and then start thinking about how you're going to move forward. And in that few moments when perception is occurring, disorientation or, you know, feelings of uh, panic or as your body is adjusting and fine tuning uh, into the situation, almost like a lens focusing on a picture. At first, everything's bl blurry, but as soon as it starts to focus and you see the images, you get an idea of what you're looking at. And that's sort of like, kind of like perception. So, okay, so an interpretation. And when we think about interpretation, of course, you know, um, how it's basically our cognitive process of putting the pieces together to understand what's, re what's happened. Uh, once your intention has been drawn to certain stimuli and you have been grouped or organized, you have grouped or organized information, this information, the next step is to uncover the reasons behind the actions. Um, even if your attention is called to the same information and you organize it in the same way your friend does, you may still interpret it differently or make different assumptions uh, about what you've perceived. You know, you think about it in a, um, you're in a situation with some friends and suddenly uh, two of your friends get up and say they have to leave. You know, you say in a group of six people and two people suddenly have to leave. Your perception could be, oh, well, they must not like what we're talking about or the food or the restaurant or they must be upset with us. Someone else's, your friend's perception could be, oh, you know, I think they just want to have some alone time uh, and it has nothing to do with us. It's more about the two of them. So different things that can occur with interpretation. Now retrieval, uh, each stage of the perception process becomes part of one's memory. This information is stored in our memory and must be retrieved uh, for us to use it again in the future. But all of us at, uh, at times have trouble retrieving stored information. It takes us a minute or two to, to think about this, remember it, and as our memory kind of fades, so does some of the information that we, that we rely on to be retrieved. And that's why schemas can, you know, can make it difficult for people to remember things not um, included in them. You know, uh, if you're holding the prototype of a good worker as someone showing lots of effort, punctuality, intelligence, artic their, their articulativeness, decisiveness, you may emphasize those traits and overlook others when evaluating the performance of a team member who you generally consider good, you know. Um, so it's really, part of what you perceived in the past 
helps you perceive things in the future. So it's sort of a shortcut. So if we perceive something in the past and we've understood it, perceived it and stored it in our memory, when the same situation comes up again, it's sort of like we can flash access that memory to help us perceive and understand what's happening a little bit more quicker. Okay. Impression management. So let's talk about this for a minute. Um, the systematic attempt to behave in ways that will create and maintain desired, desired impressions in the eyes of others. Now, what does that mean? Oh, well, let's take, for example, um, someone who's very successful in the company. Uh, or, or someone maybe who started a company, uh, you know, that has a reputation that's created an impression upon um, its competitors, its workers uh, from, you know, past actions. Think of it as a way that we help people to perceive us in the way that we want to be perceived. So this impression management is a way that you're managing the way other people perceive you. Uh, for example, you can, if you're going to a work environment, maybe you're dressing smart, uh, wearing uh, smart looking glasses, dressing um, a little more formal for work, uh, you know, hanging around with the right people in the office at lunch or associating with, you know, with the right people that gives a better impression of who you are and how powerful you are or how smart you are. You know, uh, it could also be for me when I was at work, my impression management was I always kept a messy desk, even though I hated it. I like things to be a lot clean and tidy. But I remember that, you know, if you walk into the office and someone's desk is perfectly clean and tidy, what do you think? Oh, they have nothing. They're not working on anything. They have nothing to do. So I always kept piles of paper and, and multiple projects on my desk to look like I was really busy. So as soon as my boss came, I could say, oh, I'm working on this. And I have this i got to finish later. So I always gave the, to give the impression I was a very hard worker and I was very dedicated, even though that may have not been the actual case at some of these jobs. So I did this impression management by making people seem that I was very busy. I was a little uh, stressed because I had so much work, and that was a way of managing the impression I was a hard worker, and also a way of preventing me from getting additional new work by saying, "Okay, he's too busy. Let's give it to someone else who has a clean desk that needs some else, something else to do." Um, and also, when I talked to people at work, or I always uh, gave the impression that I was knowledgeable and that I could easily get the answer, and you know, or um, you know, just trying to maintain um, this impression that I knew what I was doing. And this, this typical, or I had a confidence, or I knew the way to proceed. And this, you know, served me well. And, and as people started, you know, believing it, you can, you, you know, basically, for the most part, it was true, but I needed other people to recognize that and believe that. And that's all part of this managing impressions. Okay, so when we talk about stereotypes, and this is, you know, something we're all very familiar with, uh, and it's and we basically a, assign um, common characteristics to a group of people um, that we feel a group of people have to an individual that belongs to that group, and it's a way of when we see someone, we perceive them based on our stereotypes at first. Before we get to know them, we may just simply see that somebody is a, is uh, young, so we perceive inexperienced. That they don't know what they're doing, you know, um, they like all sorts of crazy music. That, these are just stereotypes of someone who is in, say, high school. Um, so we kind of use them to help form our initial impression of them, our perception of them. But then, you know, when we actually get to know them, we find out the, the true, uh, more clearer perception of them. Now, stereotypes can be dangerous because it can lead us to over underestimate people uh, and it can lead us to certain biases in the workplace. So these things need to be, um, it's not that stereotypes are, um, of everybody are always bad. If they, they provide you a shortcut to basically help to understand and perceive somebody, uh, but they shouldn't be in place 
to a point where you're ignorant of what they giving them a chance to see who they really are you know but we all know that some of some of the worst stereotypes are, are when you're categorizing people by race or religion or or country of origin i mean stereotypes can come in many le levels um and some of them are much more um, can be much more harmful to the workplace than others. You know, so we always have to be we always have to fight against the stereotypes that we believe or we're taught or we see on TV, because you know the truth is everybody is different, and there's really um, no advantage to try to uh, immediately place someone in a box. You should always give them the opportunity to for them. To see the true attributes before you really perceive and judge them. Okay. You know, and as I was saying before, common stereotypes: um, racial, ethnic, gender, ability, age, uh, and, and some of them are very much frowned upon, and then some of them really uh, are just commonplace. You know, especially age uh, that. You know, it's a tricky uh, subject because we all have these stereotypes. We all think about these stereotypes. But we have to uh, be careful not to let them influence our true perception of people and their abilities. Uh, and when people actually let the stereotypes make decisions for them, they really miss out on the ability to uh, utilize these people's talents. I think a big example is in, during World War II, uh, the Nazis were had a lot of stereotypes about many different people, Jews, gypsies, uh, disabled, uh, gay people. And they, you know, systematically, these people fled this, the country. Uh, many of these people who fled came to America and were instrumental in us having the abilities um, to develop uh, certain strategies and weapons that enable us eventually to win the war. So one of the great things about the United States is that um, we've been able to incorporate the strengths of all different people um which which has kept us very innovative very fresh and very globally minded you know and the 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 big reason for that is the organizational behavior of corporations is to accept the people for their differences not to reject them for their differences so that's why stereotypes have to be fought against in the workplace and and and, and people need to be encouraged to work with each other's strengths and not, you know, put people in boxes so quickly. Okay, let's talk about this halo effect. Um, now, when we look at one attribute of a person or a situation is used to develop an overall Im impression and total understanding of somebody, that's basically this halo effect. Um, so like stereotypes, they distort, uh, the distor these distortions are more likely to occur in, in the organizational stage of perception. So halo examples are common in our everyday lives. Uh, when meeting a new person, for example, a pleasant smile can, can lead to a positive first impression uh, of an overall warmth and honest person. The result of this ha halo effect is the same as that association with the stereotype. However, uh, in that individual differences are obscured. Hail effects are particularly important in the performance appraisal process. They can influence a manager's evaluation of subordinates' uh, work performance. For example, people with good attendance records may be viewed as intelligent, responsible individuals, um, while those with poor performance or attendance records are considered poor performers. Such con conclusions may be valid or invalid, but a manager to get a true imp impression of somebody rather than the halo effect result, they really need to look at the entire person's performance, all their attributes and all uh, the person as a, as a whole rather than select pieces. Um, so basically you get the idea here. So one particular aspect of a person um, overshadows the rest of them. You know, and this is something that you need to be aware of. And we looked at selective perception. Um, this could be someone who's trying to single out um, a particular angle of a situation, person or object that's consistent with, with their own needs, value, and attitudes. 
um, its strongest impact occurs in the attention stage of the attention stage of the perception process. This um, perceptual dis distortion uh, was identified in classic research studied involved involving executives in the manufacturing uh, companies when asked to identify the key problem in a comprehensive business case each executive selected problems consist consistent with his or her own functional areas and work assignments you know so their selective perception looks at the problem from a financial aspect a marketing aspect a sales aspect whatever they were closest to um, you know most marketing executives view the problem as an area of sales, whereas production may look to it's you know a problem of production or organization. So um, the perception may be skewed to their more closer reality. Okay, projection. Um, now this is this is when someone is going to going to assign their own personal issues to other individuals. So a projection is um, taking your own thoughts and feelings uh, on certain situations and um, cueing them over to somebody else. You know, for example, uh, somebody may be mad at their coworker and they project that onto other coworkers as, as well and are mad at all their coworkers. Or maybe someone's mad at their mother and they project this hostility onto their um, female manager who, who is, is sort of um, similar to their mother and they're projecting their feelings and attitudes they have for their mother onto this uh, manager. And these are, these are things that people need to be aware of. And you know, it's very much involved in psychology and people bring, basically people bring their baggage to work. And their baggage they bring to work, they try to live out and work out their problems on the people they're working with um, that they have the same types of issues and problems they have at home. And this is something that someone who's not very self-aware, which we learned from the other chapter, can, can continue to, to do at work if they don't have a proper awareness of their own thoughts and feelings. Okay, contrast effects. Now, we mentioned earlier how um, a bright red sports car would stand out from a group of gray sedans. This shows a contrasting effect or contrast effect in which the meaning or interpretation of, of something is arrived at by contrasting it with a recently occurring event or situation. This form of perception distortion can occur, say, when a person gives a talk following a strong speaker or is interviewed for a job following a series of uh, mediocre applicants. A contrast effect occurs when individual's characteristics are contrasted uh, with those of recently encountered who rank higher or lower uh, on similar characteristics. So when you're comparing con contrasting uh, groups of people, you know, you may have had, like I was saying before, you may have had five really horrible job applicants. Somebody that comes in that's just mediocre, maybe not perfect for the job, but he's so much better than what you've interviewed before, you think that they're much, much more than they really are. Okay. Self-fulfilling prophecies. This is a tendency of, uh, when, if a person has a certain perception uh, in a situation and expects a certain outcome, they all, almost create the outcome. Um, so the self-fulfilling prophecy is, uh, I expect, you know, to be horrible to work with these people based on my initial perception of what they look like, how they act and talk. Uh, I think that it's going to be a real nightmare working with them. And then you actually create that whole, that perception creates a reality and you, you, you self-fulfill the whole initial um, prophecy for yourself. And that's why it's important to have an open mind and when you go into situations, not necessarily believe this is going to be the ultimate outcome. Really giving a situation a chance um, to develop freely without you steering it into a particular direction. Okay. So let's think about your experience. 
Think about a self-fulfilling prophecy, the construct. Which of the following would not be a good idea? Okay. Instill confidence in your staff. Identify errors in employees' performance and refer to them often. Uh, treat all employees as if they are star performers. Set high performance goals. So think about that for a second. Okay, so I think you can agree that B, identifying errors in employees' performance and referring to them often is not a good idea. Uh, if you, you know, if you identify a problem in someone's performance and you're constantly hitting them over the head with that, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It just wears them down to the point where they are not going to be good performers. Uh, and you must, you may have seen this in relationships where, um, so I was currently nag, constantly nagging you or bringing up one, uh, one aspect and, you know, really ruining your whole self-esteem over it. Uh, so, all right, moving on. Let's look at attribution. Okay. So, it's a way of um, developing explanations or assigning causes to particular situations. And it can be classified in either internal or external causes. Now, so we're really looking for an answer here. Uh, when, manager, our, when managers are asked to identify or attribute causes of poor performance among subordinates, they most often blame the internal deficiencies of the individual, lack of ability or effort, uh, rather than external deficiencies in the situation, lack of support, lack of, um, especially, it's especially lack of support from managers. And it, 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 this is basically a fundamental attribution error, the tendency to underestimate the influence of situational factors and to overestimate the influence of personal factors when evaluating someone else's behavior. Um, so internal causes are basically within the individual or things the individual can control and external causes are coming from outside the person's uh, direct influence. Uh, so it's really just, you know, to have a balanced attribution, you really have to think of both internal and external and uh, have an open mind to really have a full consideration of these events when trying to make a link between perception and attribution. Um, okay, so let's just look into this a little bit more. Okay, so if we think of uh, distinctiveness, uh, consider how consistent a person's behavior is across different situations. Um, if a person's performance is typically low, regardless of the t technology which he is working with or on, uh, we tend to assign poor performance uh, to the person directly. And there's, there's something wrong with that employee. Uh, if the poor performance is unusual, we tend to assign to an external cause to explain it. You know, something happened in the work environment. Um, consciousness. I'm sorry, consensus uh, is basically, if you think of consensus, you think of sort of a group's total opinion or, or gathered uh, wisdom. So it's the likelihood of others acting in a similar way. Consistency is, the, you know, is the person's response or actions the same uh, or usual or similar to the past? Okay, so that's three kind of links between perception and attribution. Um, okay, so if we look at this chart here, um, now we're we're talking of talking about this a little bit before. Um, so let's just look at this a little closer. Causes of poor performance by subordinates. You know, uh, most frequent attribution. Uh, cause of poor performance by themselves. So if we look at this, um, if we look at the middle, the most frequent attribution, lack of ability, lack of effort, lack of support. So if it's, if it's looking at it by 
themselves, they're going to see, you know, few um, areas of lack of ability and few areas of lack of effort, but many areas of lack of support. However, if the performance is being um, happening by their subordinates, then you're going to think many more um, characteristics of lack of ability and effort and few characteristics of lack of support because that would be the area that you're providing. So the attributions can cause a distortion between the managers and the subordinates depending on you know, how they're viewing the way they perceive the situation is occurring. And we were talking about this before, the attribution errors, and it's really um, how you're going to attribute your, your shortcomings compared to how someone else is going to attribute them. Uh, and, it, you know, you're not going to want to uh, admit or recognize that it's your fault entirely, where as a manager, if they're isolating you and, and talking to you about it, are really basically trying to focus on how it is your fault. So we really have a chasm here between two different perceptions that have to be have to meet somewhere in the middle in order to improve to change and improve this tendency or this error. Now, if we look at a self-serving bias, um, it's it's when you have a bias, you're basically trying to pretend uh, or deny or take responsibility for the poor performance uh, problems. Um, At the same time, anything that is successful, you're going to want to take responsibility for. Uh, you can think about this in terms of, you know, someone who runs around talking about and accepting the credit for all the successes, but having excuses or trying to dismiss any failures. Uh, if it was, say, investing, it would be someone who constantly runs around and talks about the money they made in these various different stocks, but yet they're never discussing the money they've lost in other areas or other stocks. Um, if it's, we're talking about school and you, you get an A in the class, it's because you studied or it's because you're smart. If you got a D in the class, it's because the teacher is stupid or the work was ridiculous or it had no connection to reality and isn't useful, so it didn't deem the worthiness for you to even try. You know, so you're so you're trying to build up this self-serving bias to protect one's ego or one's identity. Okay. Uh, okay. So this link. Let's talk a little bit more about this link between perception and attribution. Um, you know, and I want to remind you: do not overlook the external causes of others' behaviors. You know, identify and confront your stereotypes, biases, and preconceived notions so you have a more clearer lens to look through. You know, you want to be objective and you don't want to judge quickly when it comes to, um, you know, others. Uh, you want to be as open minded and as clear thinking about the current facts and situations and sometimes you have to work to cord cutting out those perceived shortcuts your mind wants to throw in those schemas or past events and you want to take everything from a fresh angle to be fair basically there's a YouTube link here at the bottom of this slide that sort of um, goes over these ideas uh, it's a little corny so uh, I'm not gonna uh, say it's a must to watch okay so let's move over to cultural differences. Now, we know that um, culture is something that's involved with people's backgrounds. And uh, as you encounter more people from different cultures and different uh, environments that are not identical to yours, this could be a conflict. Um, Now, so how can I say, if you're in a particular, um, let me just think about this for a second, how's the best way to say it? Okay, I guess you could look at it this way. If it's a more individualistic culture, the managers are going to attribute the employee's performance um, to more internal causes of those, individual, in those individuals. Um, 
in the collectivist culture, it's going to be emphasizing um, more of the group's failure rather than the individual's failure. So it's really just looking at is it more individually focused or more collectively focused. Okay, so social learning theory. Um, now this describes how um, learning takes place through a collection of interactions amongst people's behaviors, environment, situations. Um, individual, an individual uses models or um, learning techniques to acquire behavior observed by imitating others. Uh, in the work situation, the model may be a higher manager or coworker who dem demonstrates a desired behavior. Um, you know, mentor or senior workers uh, who befriend, befriend younger workers uh, and more, you know, take on sort of a protege and, you know, lead by example. So the social learning is sort of picking up cues of more predominant members in the group and then um, rep, rep, replicating those behaviors. You know, so if it was, if you were a group of siblings and there were, you know, three older siblings and two younger siblings, the younger siblings would pick up social uh, learning cues from the older siblings, you know, as their role models. Pretty easy concept. The, um, all right, I'm going to skip this slide. Okay, so let's go back to this term that, um, Self-efficacy was mentioned in the earlier chapter, and it's basically the, uh, the belief that you can get something done, that you are adequate and skilled. Uh, now, people with high self-efficacy believe that they have the necessary abilities for a given job, and that they're capable of the effort required of them, and there's no, no outside events will hinder them from you know, performing well or achieving results. So it's, it's, it's kind of related to confidence, and it's also related to the perception that you look at a particular situation and you feel, oh, I could get this done within the deadline. I'm perfectly capable of this. And, you know, um, so it's sort of you're, you're relying on your past experiences and knowing yourself that you can get things done. And there are some people with a lower self-efficacy believe no matter how hard they try, they're not going to be able to manage the work project or environment and not going to be successful. Now, the problem is that, you know, if you feel that you're not going to be able to do something and you're really not able to do it, that's a good thing. So it's not always bad to have a low self-efficacy if it's true. If you have, you know, if you're overconfident or have a high self-efficacy, then you may actually overestimate your abilities and put yourself in a situation where you're not going to be able to perform or complete to get the desired results. So a person's understanding of themselves, the better someone understands themselves and their abilities, the more accurate this perception will be between ability and performance. And it's important as you know, you um, get more experience in the workplace, your, your perception of efficacy becomes more appropriate and you're better able to communicate to your managers what you can or can't get done in a, in a certain matter of time. Okay. Now, reinforcement is um, a result of a particular behavior. So, it can be a consequence, it can be a, a reward. Um, so, managing a particular reinforcement uh, can change um, the direction level or persistence of an individual's behavior. Uh, to best understand I, this idea, it's helpful to review concepts of conditioning and reinforcement that you may have already learned in the basic psychology class. But I, I guess you can understand that you know if an employee pr behaves in an appropriate way, in a successful way, they're rewarded with a bonus or uh, a pay raise or, or, or just a verbal, um, you know, Let's see, a verbal reinforcement of, you know, that you liked what they did and you're happy with them to, you know, to help, you know, encourage that behavior more often. Whereas negative reinforcement, you know, a shunning someone or calling them out or embarrassing someone uh, is a way to help prevent undesirable behavior, you know, in the future.
And in the workplace, you know, these rewards and punishment bonuses or punishments um, are ways of managers to get employees to work in a way that they want them to be. Um, so we have, if we look at the classic conditioning. Um, if you talk, you think about Pavlov and his dog, it's a form of learning through association that involves the manipulation of stimulus uh, to influence behavior. Um, and this guy taught dogs to salivate at the sound of a bell by ringing it when he was feeding the dog. So, the sal so he could ring the bell and the dogs would salivate without even, you know, you know getting any food. Um, sort of like when we think about lemons sometimes or we may sort of our mouth may be sort of getting ready to accept that sour taste by even sometimes becoming watery even though we haven't or go, aren't going to eat the lemon. Um, now a stimulus is something that is going to um, incite an action or draw a response in a situation. Okay, now if we, we talk about operant conditioning, um, the process of controlling behavior by uh, manipulating consequences. Um, and this is more of a learning by reinforcing. Um, so you may think of operant conditioning as um, something quite common in today's educational system. In a work setting, the goal is to reinforce principles by systematically reinforce reinforcing desirable behavior and discouraging undesirable behavior. Operant conditioning calls uh, for examining uh, behavior and consequences um, uh, example an argument with the boss um, to work overtime you know um, if the employee actually does overtime work this is the behavior uh, the consequence would be the boss's praise. Um, in, the operant, in operant conditioning, the consequence strengthens behavior and makes it more likely to occur, um, you know, the next time. Okay. All right, so if we look at this chart, you know, classic conditioning, a uh, person sees the boss smile and hears the boss's criticism, you know, behavior feels nervous, grits teeth, and later sees a smile, feels nervous, grits teeth. So it's associating a smile with the criticism. Even though the boss may smile with no criticism, they're still observing the same behavior. Uh, operant conditioning, you know, person works overtime, the boss gets the boss's praise. And later works overtime again, although there may not be a, a praise for it, but that's sort of the conditioning. All right. Let's talk about laws of effect. Um, this is simple but powerful. Behavior that results in a pleasant outcome is likely to be repeated, of course. Uh, whereas behavior that results in an unpleasant outcome is not likely to be repeated. Uh, the implications of this law are rather straightforward. If you want more of a behavior, you must make the consequence uh, uh, of the individual positive. The Intrinsic reward, such as pay and praise, are positively valued work outcomes that are given to individuals by another person. So if they want you to keep going to work, they have to keep paying you. How long would you work at a job if they said, listen, we can no longer afford to pay you? Would you stay you know, another week, another two weeks, or would you leave immediately? Um, and these are all meant to uh, include... to in, influence and encourage certain behaviors. Okay, in your experience, you work really hard at your job and you are not rewarded. The law of, the law of effect would suggest that you will A, quit, B, keep trying to impress the right people. So there, there really is this no right answer to this. It's either one or the other. Um, I guess over time, if you have a, put a lot of hard work in, and you're never rewarded, you may just quit and find a different situation for yourself. And there are some people that will just keep trying to impress. So um, what would you do in that situation? How long would it take for you to be 
not recognized and unrewarded before you would want to um, quit? And how long would you keep trying in, in certain jobs? Here's just some examples of some rewards. Um, some of them that are direct costs to the, to the company. Uh, some of them, there are no direct costs, you know, and, and, and oddly enough, a lot of times the, the rewards that don't cost anything, the smiling, the compliments, special jobs, recognition, feedback, those are the ones that the company, that managers are most stingy with in a lot of cases where they're, you know, you need a combination of both. Even though you keep getting bonuses or getting pay increases, that's sometimes not enough to motivate somebody. You feel like if you had more money, you would stay with the job or you feel more appreciated. But without having that um, direct complimentary feedback and recognition and, and, and approval from one's managers or superiors, you're really not going to have a total uh, satisfac job satisfaction. So an employee really needs to have a combination of these two types of rewards to feel satisfied. Okay, so organizational behavior modification, or OB mod. So here we're talking about four basic reinforcement strategies: positive reinforcement, praise, you know, um, bonuses; negative reinforcement, uh, you know, um, punishing people, giving them a worse job, or you know, um, well, I guess punishment and extinction. So let's, t let's talk about these for a minute. Positive reinforcement. I think we can all understand this one. Um, someone does something good and we give them a reinforcement to help them understand that they should repeat that behavior, repeat those desirable behaviors. Um, now, um, you, the reward can be given close um, when the behavior basically occurs. Um, so you, so I guess you, what we're basically saying, the, there are two different ways of getting this, this positive reinforcement. It can occur, they say it's more successful if it occurs when the behavior has recently occurred rather than rewarding it later. So, you know, for example, I'm not sure how to put this. I mean, so you could get the reward sort of as it's occurring or after it's occurred. Uh, generally, it's thought of that the closer to um, the perfect sweet spot is when the behavior has just ended and the reward is uh, placed upon them to encourage them to continue or do it again. If the time elapses too long between the, the good behavior and the reward, they may be less likely to duplicate that behavior before the reward is given. You know, common sense. Um, okay, so there's this concept called shaping. Uh, creation of new behaviors by the positive reinforcement of successive approximations to it. So, but what does that really mean? What are we really talking about here? Say, for example, a new machine operator uh, in a manufacturing plant must learn a complex series of tasks to get the machine to work. Um, so, how can I say this? As, as you're going along doing the correct path or the correct um, set of instructions or operations, you get some sort of feedback along the way to keep moving forward, I guess is one way you could say it. I guess you can think of it, uh, if you've ever played a video game, in order to get to the next level, you have to master or meet, um, complete the first level. So sort of a, a way of uh, successively moving forward. And, and like in a video game, if you complete the first level, you get certain accomplishments and praise or, you know, or a reward, and then you successfully move to the next level. So that would sort of be shaping a situation. 
Okay, so continuous reinforcement. Um, so this is where the reward is administered every time the desired behavior occurs. Um, there, I remember there was an episode of The Office where every time the phone the phone rang, I think, uh, Jim would offer Dwight a candy. Uh, and then he was conditioning him to do this reward situation. And then um, at a certain point, he took away the reward. And then Dwight had expected it, say, hey, where's my mint? And he says, what are you talking about? Why should I give you a mint? So it's sort of like he played a, a joke on Dwight. Um, I think you have to see the episode more than I'm explaining it. But uh, in intermittent reinforcement is rewards that are only given periodically. So, you know, if you were training a dog, you'd give continuous reinforcement every time in the beginning, every time he laid down or did a trick, you'd give him a treat. So every time he did the trick, he'd get a treat so that he was doing the trick in order to get the treat. After a while, if the dog is, you know, gets into the routine of this and trained um, continuously, you can move to a more intermittent re reinforcement where they'll stu still do the trick, but you only give them the reward occasionally and they'll still continue to exhibit this behavior. Okay. Let's see, where are we here? Okay, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna skip this slide because it's basically what we've already talked about. I'm gonna move into uh, negative reinforcement. Now, um, So this is used, um, for example, if we take away the negative consequence, we do this in order to increase the chances that the behavior, um, the desired behavior will be repeated. You know, for example, a manager regularly nags a worker about being late for work and then doesn't nag uh, the worker the next time they show up on time. So the term negative reinforcement comes from the withdrawal of negative consequences um, and the strategy is also sometimes called uh, avoidance learning. So when someone nags you or gives you uh, a hard time about something and then you stop doing that something in order to avoid um, that nagging or yelling or screaming or whatever the consequence is. Uh, one thing, one way of this could be, you know, those say those traffic cams. If you go through a red light or turn on right on red or um, you, get a, you get a ticket in the mail. So that negative reinforcement is going to keep you from running those red lights or making, um, not stopping while you make the right on red. Um, so it's a way to, to train the population through negative consequences to obey traffic laws. All right. Okay, punishment. I mean, this is a simple construct. If someone does do something wrong, uh, there's a consequence uh, to discourage the behavior from occurring, like um, putting a child in a timeout to help discourage uh, behavior that's undesirable. Um, let's see, in the work environment, it may be taking away a certain privilege or right uh, from an employee. You know, you may give the employee the ability to leave their desk at any time to use the bathroom or go out for a smoking break. And if they get abuses of, of doing this, you may punish them by saying, okay, you can only do this between 3 and 3.15 and 10 and 10.15. So, you know, okay, extinction. Um, and this, this would be, you know, taking away a reinforcing uh, consequence in order to um, reduce an undesirable behavior. Um, for example, uh, again, a co-worker is late, um, you know, or a worker is late for work. The co-workers provide positive reinforcement by covering for her. So the manager instructs the co-workers to stop covering, uh, thus uh, withdrawing this positive consequence of her tardiness and the use of this extinction trying to get her to get her get rid of the undesirable behavior um, you know so for example you know that's I, I would say most companies a fireable offense if you're covering up for someone's lateness or changing someone's actual time uh, and I think firing some of those co-workers for doing that would be a way of extincting that behavior um, but I, I don't think it's always the best solution 
All right. Okay, so if you think about learning through uh, reinforcement and you know behavior modification behavior modification techniques that managers and companies may use um, within your organization to um, encourage desirable uh, actions or outcomes can be very powerful and effective in encouraging certain performances from employees. Uh, you know, when done right and done evenly and fairly, these behavior, mo behavior modifications can really change an average or mediocre workforce into an, a, to an, um, an exceptional workforce. Now, there have been times that these rewards and punishments and techniques, you know, they can be inappropriate at times, they can be used unethically, they could be used uh, unfairly, and in that case, it can be a real demotivator for the rest of the employees or that one employee. You know, sometimes leading to a fact where someone will leave or quit a job over it, over one of these techniques, when and therefore, you know, the company losing a, a valued employee who had a lot of experience. So, you know, they have to be used with a level of intelligence uh, when deploying them on actual people. And I would say the best thing to do in, in most cases is to clearly communicate the certain uh, rewards or punishment an employee can experience at the company and, and, and illustrate and articulate the, the, the behaviors that are trying to be encouraged or just encouraged. So that way an employee doesn't have to find out the hard way or the employee has something to uh, really strive for. So communication is key, I believe, in keeping these things fair um, and keeping the bosses open-minded and having some sort of feedback upon the utilization and the effectiveness of these techniques is critical to keeping them on track and keeping them uh, up to date. Okay, so that is chapter four. Join me again uh, next time when we'll be talking about motivation theories in chapter five. Thank you.